This Georgia Department of Education screencast is intended to provide teachers of fifth grade social studies with content knowledge to aid in the teaching of the Georgia Standards of Excellence. In this screencast, we will look at what it means to be a U.S. citizen, including the rights every U.S. citizen is guaranteed under the United States Constitution, and a few of the amendments that have been found to be necessary over the years to ensure those rights are protected for everyone. We will also look at the process by which our Constitution can be amended and spend some time going over just a few of the many responsibilities a U.S. citizen has. If we were to ask the average fifth grade student what they don't like about social studies, the answer we often hear is, it's about a bunch of old dead guys doing boring stuff that happened a long time ago. What they are really trying to say is that what they learn seems disconnected and unrelated to their lives. They do not see the value in learning about it. They do not see that all of that history has created the living, breathing government that is the framework for our lives today. That everything that has gone before has an immeasurable effect on what is going on now and will, in turn, shape our futures. Our civic understanding standards are a great way to bridge this gap, for it is these very concepts and ideals that our nation's founders deliberately built into our Constitution that provide for the freedoms our students currently enjoy. Our Constitution is unique in that it gives individual citizens a great deal of power over their government. But as Voltaire once said, though Uncle Ben from Spider-Man made it famous, with great power comes great responsibility. And U.S. citizens do have many responsibilities. As a clarification, our standard requires that students understand what rights our Constitution protects and what our responsibilities as a citizen are, not that they be able to identify the difference between rights and responsibilities, especially as there is some overlap between the two. In fact, many of the responsibilities of U.S. citizens revolve around protecting and defending our constitutionally guaranteed rights. For example, we, as U.S. citizens, have a responsibility to vote, to participate in the democratic process set forth in our Constitution. As explained in a previous video, our country is not a direct democracy, but rather a democratic republic, the difference being that the U.S. citizens do not have to run off to the voting polls for each and everything that needs to be decided. That would be very impractical, though we do vote for some specific measures. Mostly, we vote for people who we feel will represent us well, and they do the actual voting for most things. Because of this, some feel that their individual vote does not matter. However, it is through our vote that we determine the course of our government, and the people who will lead it. We ensure that our representatives vote on issues according to our will, through the power of withholding our vote for them if they do not. Even Ben Franklin, in his speech given the day the final draft of the Constitution was signed, acknowledged that our system may not be perfect, but it is about as close to it as any group of people may get. However, it is meaningless if the people do not exercise their right and responsibility to vote. In order to vote responsibly, citizens have the responsibility to stay informed of the issues affecting their communities and educating themselves about the candidates running for public office. Our students often have strong opinions about community issues, but don't always fully understand what causes them and why they are not easily resolved. There are a number of kid-friendly online news publications that make a great resource for some lively classroom discussions and provide a real-world meaningful vehicle for teaching persuasive writing and many other ELA skills. Another responsibility all U.S. citizens have is to support and defend both our Constitution and our country. That does not mean we cannot disagree with aspects of either. In fact, the very right to do so was built directly into the document and is a founding principle of our country. Once again, I will defer to the very wise Ben Franklin when he spoke of his feelings about signing the Constitution. He said, The opinions I have had of its errors I sacrifice to the public good. I have never whispered a syllable of them abroad. Within these walls they were born, and here they will die. He felt it was extremely important that while we may argue within our borders, we must show a united front to foreign nations. So yes, we have the right to speak out, to protest, to disagree peacefully, and many servicemen and women have sacrificed their lives to defend our right to do so. But we should never take for granted that we live in a country that allows us that privilege. As mentioned earlier, many citizen rights are tied directly to citizen responsibilities. Unlike in many other countries, our citizens have a right to a prompt and fair trial by a jury of their peers. For this system to work, however, every citizen must take seriously their responsibility to serve on a jury when they are called. 
our entire court system is based on the idea that it would be very unfair for someone's guilt or innocence to be determined by a person who has not lived a similar life, and may not understand what that person experiences on a daily basis. To put it metaphorically, we should not be judged by people who have not walked a mile in our shoes. By creating a jury of twelve people from varying walks of life, a defendant has a much greater chance of being judged by people who have shared similar life experiences, or who can at least relate to them. Let's face it, running a country, defending its borders, and providing services to its citizens takes money, and so while we may not like it, a citizen also has the responsibility to help pay for it. Yes, we are talking taxes. After studying the American Revolution, students may erroneously believe that our founding fathers did not want to pay taxes, but that is absolutely not true. What they objected to was taxation without representation. They understood we must all pitch in. What they objected to was not having a voice in how the country was run. So while it may pain us to do so, paying taxes is an important responsibility. America is truly a nation of immigrants. Less than 1% of our population is American Indian. Everyone else's families came from some other country at some point. In fact, one of the early objections to the U.S. entering World War I was that too many of our soldiers would be fighting against the countries their families came from. Because of this, U.S. citizens have a responsibility to respect each other's rights, beliefs, and opinions, whether we agree with them or not. Finally, at least for our discussion here, the last responsibility we will look at is the responsibility to obey all federal, state, and local laws. Your students may ask, but what if a law is unfair or outdated, or I am accused of breaking a law when I really didn't? I am so glad you asked that, because our Constitution has provided for just such things. The drafters of our Constitution had that very same concern and insisted that an amendment be included within the Bill of Rights that guarantees citizens due process under the law. But what exactly do the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments mean? What is due process? In short, it means no citizen can have their life, liberty, or pursuit of happiness taken away from them until they have been fairly treated by the law and found guilty. There are many laws at the federal, state, and local level that are in place to help ensure citizens receive due process from the very first encounter with police all the way through the court system and into any punishment they may be given. Due process doesn't necessarily mean you will like the outcome, but rather that the procedures will be fair. There are many laws regarding what the police can and cannot do because of due process. For example, police cannot arrest you or search you or your property unless they have good reason to believe you have done something wrong, and for search warrants and many arrests, a judge must agree with them and issue a warrant. Anyone who has watched a police or crime show has heard the person being arrested being read their Miranda rights. Those rights are another example of the due process protections citizens have. We do indeed have the right to remain silent and to have an attorney appointed to us. You may want to let your students know that their Miranda rights only come into play if the police plan to question or interrogate them. They are still required to give police their name, age, address, and similar information. Due process rules can be found throughout the courtroom. As a U.S. citizen, you have a right to a fair and speedy trial by a jury of your peers, as we discussed above. Due process also gives you the right to an attorney, and the right to question your accusers and to bring in your own witnesses. Additionally, there are a great number of laws around what can and cannot be used as evidence against you based on due process. Should a citizen be found guilty, there are a number of protections given as to what constitutes a fair punishment and how parole works. These are just a few examples of how the right to due process works in our society. There are many more protections that we simply do not have the time to go into here. And while our legal system is not perfect by any means, like our Constitution, it is about as close to it as fallible people can get. Still, our Founding Fathers recognized that the world would change, and events and changing beliefs they could not foresee could impact our rights and how well our government serves us. To that end, they created a system that would allow us to change or amend our Constitution if truly needed, but that would also prevent it from unnecessary, irresponsible, or capricious changes. There are two paths by which our Constitution can be amended. One is where either House of Congress proposes an amendment and it receives at least a two-thirds majority vote in both houses. 
The requirement that at least two-thirds of each house votes in favor of it helps ensure that it is something that most people want and not just a small faction pushing through their own agenda. This is the one situation in which the president does not have any say in the process, which makes sense because even if he or she were to veto an amendment, a two-thirds majority bypasses the veto anyway. As you know, many people at the time our Constitution was written were very concerned about the federal government having more power than the individual states, so they insisted on a pathway for states to amend the Constitution should Congress fail to act on their behalf. So states may also propose an amendment by calling for a constitutional convention. However, to keep individual states or a small regional group of states from pushing their own self-interests, an amendment started in this fashion must be presented to a convention that is attended by at least two-thirds of the country's state legislatures. For either path, the next step is for the National Archivist to take the amendment through the ratification process. The archivist sends the proposed amendment to the governor of each state, who then presents it to the state's legislature. Once three-fourths of the country's state legislatures have ratified it, the amendment becomes part of the Constitution. As our world changes, our government must be flexible enough to change with it. So let's take a look at some of the important changes to our Constitution that were necessary over the years to protect our rights, specifically our right to vote. As anyone who has ever had an argument knows, just because you lose the fight doesn't mean you have changed what you believe, and such was the case for the South at the end of the Civil War. Despite having lost, Southern white wealthy landowners were not willing to give up their power or their desire to deny former slaves their rights due to them under the Constitution. They first tried to argue that African Americans or blacks were not truly citizens despite having been born in this country. When the Fourteenth Amendment prevented that argument by granting citizenship to anyone born within our borders, they tried to argue that their status of having once been a slave was a reason to deny them the right to vote. Congress acted by passing the Fifteenth Amendment, which guarantees the right to vote for any man, regardless of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Unfortunately, the South still managed to disenfranchise most Southern African Americans or blacks through discriminatory practices such as poll taxes, literacy tests, intimidation, and refusal to allow registration, and outright violence. You may have noticed that the language of the Fifteenth Amendment, which says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied on account of race, color, or previous servitude, does not include gender. It took many years, protests, and speeches for the Constitution to be amended for the nineteenth time in order for women to be able to vote in this country. The Twenty-Third Amendment came about due to a unique set of circumstances our Founding Fathers did not anticipate that ended up denying some citizens the right to vote. Back when we were first setting up our government, Congress felt that in the spirit of fairness, the capital, or home to the seat of the federal government, would not be in an actual state to keep any one state from being seen as having an unfair advantage. And so the District of Columbia was created from a small bit of very rural land. Being a district made it a part of our country, but kept it from having the same power or rights as a full-fledged state. Unfortunately, as our populace grew and more people needed to live and work in Washington, D.C., it became apparent that it was not fair to deny people living in the district their right to vote simply because they were not a state. The 23rd Amendment allows for districts to have electors in the Electoral College, which is how we choose our president, the same as if they were a state. Amazingly enough, despite the passage of the 15th Amendment that was supposed to give all men the right to vote, many people in this country, particularly in the South, were still being denied these rights through many devious tactics. One such tactic was the poll tax. The idea behind the poll tax was basically to charge money to vote, ensuring that poorer people would be less likely to cast their vote. The 24th Amendment made it unconstitutional to charge a poll tax to vote in a federal election. Unfortunately, that still allowed them to charge taxes for state and local elections. Eventually, the Supreme Court ruled that all poll taxes violated the 14th Amendment. Surprisingly, the U.S. Constitution does not specify who is qualified to vote in this country, but rather leaves that power to the states. Historically, most states set the minimum age to vote at 21. In the years leading up to World War II, 
President Roosevelt saw America's entry into the war as inevitable, and in order to prepare our country and to build a sizable army, he instituted the draft and set the age for military service at 18 years old. Soon cries of, old enough to fight, old enough to vote, could be heard across the nation, but it was not until the protests of the Vietnam War once again brought forth the issue of fairness in asking our 18- to 21-year-olds to fight for a country whose government they had no say in for a change to the Constitution to be considered. With a great deal of popular support behind it, the 26th Amendment passed in July of 1971, giving all people 18 years old and up the right to vote. Students may ask, why do I need to know this stuff? Well, the simple fact is that many of the rights and their inherent responsibilities written into our Constitution, both at the outset and through the many amendments, were not always guaranteed, and many have fought with blood, sweat, tears, and even given their lives to earn and keep these rights safe from those who would take them away. It can be easy to take the freedoms we enjoy in America for granted, to forget that it hasn't always been that way that we have had to defend ourselves from many who did not believe ordinary people should have such control and power over their government. If we wish to protect and preserve those rights in the future, we must learn from the past.